Morning, everybody. <clears throat> he is risen. He is risen indeed. Man, we're good at that. Like, we didn't even practice. It, today is a celebration day, and we have been requested to, to, uh, to make today a party, in a sense, so, so that is what we are going to do. And this first song is, this is a come in from the coffee song, like normal. Uh, this is a song that you probably won't know, and that's okay, but the one thing that I will request of you is that it does have foot stomping. It's a little rowdy. Is, is how I explained it to my friend Karen Den Hartog. It is a rowdy welcome song. It requires foot stamping and it requires hand clapping. And you know what? Because it's Easter, I'm not even going to I'm not even going to like judge you on on clapping on beat, you know? <laughs> You can do one and three if you want, or you can do two and four if you want. It's bluegrass, so it won't really matter. You could do one, two, three, and four, or skip four altogether. It doesn't, it doesn't, let's stand up together. It's Easter. Let's celebrate our Lord. Certainly, you won't know this song at first, but if you learn it as we go, then sing it out real loud and, and rowdy-like, all right? Mr. Heiser, I'm looking at you. Rowdy singing is what I need from you. I wasn't keeping track of clapping, Michael. How did you do? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good morning, Woodland. Uh, um, I didn't think we got a full gusto last time we did this, but he is risen. He is risen All right. Well, Dan did it, and I thought, man, I've always wanted to do that up front, so <laughs> I had to take my shot at it. Um, well, welcome to Woodland. If you are visiting here, we are so glad that you're here this morning. What a, what a wonderful and happy, upbeat morning we have because our Savior is risen. He did not stay in the grave. He is alive. He is in us. He is on the throne, and we are celebrating that today. I wanted to share with you one of my favorite verses, or actually, it's, I think it's three verses, but uh, passages. It's in Philippians chapter 2. Um, it's basically the gospel in a nutshell. It encapsulates uh, what today is all about. It says here in verse 8, it says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name that we exalt, we glorify, we honor every day, but especially today, the name of Jesus, where the name that we have salvation through, the name of our Lord and Savior. And so let me pray for us as we continue to celebrate him being raised. Lord, thank you for this morning that you are alive. Death could not hold you in the grave. You have conquered sin, death, and the devil, Lord. And for all who put their faith in you, Lord, uh, we enjoy that same victory, Lord. Um, we enjoy the new life that you offer through faith, and, uh, and, we, and we now are seated in the heavenly realms with you because of what you accomplished during Holy Week, Lord. And so we praise you, we worship you, we keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord, and we, we just glorify you this morning and just ask that you would continue to transform our hearts and our lives so that we can look more like you, so we can um, know more about what it means to be resurrected with you, Lord, and to live a resurrected life. And so, Lord, um, we look to you, and we ask that you would meet us where we're at this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's start with lyrics that are simple. Oh, you guys ready? We have our Easter ensemble here. One, two, one, two, three. Oh, 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 oh. stand together because you're living I'm alive because your cross is powerful because you rose invincible I can get up off the floor this is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me in the grave this is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me down Say goodbye to my yesterdays Ever since I met you I am changed This is my resurrection day And nothing's gonna hold me I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day, and nothing's gonna hold me down. Good news, good news is the good news, cause you chose the rugged cross. The good news is the good news, cause you rose up from the dust. Your gospel is the power. gonna hold me in the grave this is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me down say goodbye to my yesterdays ever since i met you i am changed this is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me down this is my resurrection day nothing's gonna hold me in the grave this is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me down Say goodbye to my yesterdays Ever since I met you I am changed This is my resurrection day Nothing's gonna hold me down
even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hand. It's running through my veins I can't escape its grip In you my soul is saved You cover everything Oh, your love bled for me Oh, your blood in crimson us alive again. scripture this morning is from John chapter 20 verses 11 to 18 but Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been one at the head and the other at the foot they asked her woman why are you crying they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary... She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. 
Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. God sent his song They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He and I to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives you stand with us because he
Have a seat. So good to be with you on this special Lord's Day. And what a difference this is between this year and last year. He was risen last year too, <laughs> but somehow this is better. This message is going to move from the silly to the sublime, I promise. But I, I shared a couple weeks ago about how Amanda and I have broken a promise to each other. Before we got married, we made a prenuptial agreement that we would have no dogs in our family. No dogs. No dogs in the house, no dogs in the bed, no dogs, none. And then... Long came this year, and we have Pippa. How is that going? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> there, there has been some buyer's regret. <laughs> There's bad times. Uh, cleaning the kennel in the middle of the night wandering around outside looking for a place to do business until business is done, if business is done. Bad times. But there's good times too, right kids? There's good stuff. Uh, Pippa can do tricks. Uh, Pippa can sit. Pippa can fetch. And if she feels like it, Pippa can herd chickens. You just go out there and go get them, put them away. And she goes and finds them and brings them back. And we didn't teach her this. It's all instinct, wonderful to watch. And then the next time she'll look at you like she's never seen a chicken. And <laughs> Pippa does what Pippa wants to do. Here's the most important thing, obedience. That's, that's the most important thing. But what we've, what we've learned is that obedience begins with having the dog's attention. And so the most important command is, look at me. Look at me. Look at me, Pippa. If Pippa's not looking at, uh, at us, it doesn't matter what we tell her to do after that. She has to look at me. Now, I almost owe you an apology. 
but not quite. Because people are not dogs. When you train a dog, you're doing behavior modification. You're, you're teaching the dog to do the same thing over and over again so that the dog comes to expect what's coming next and then find some sort of solace in this, whether it's the treat or climbing into bed with somebody or whatever. Not us. Not yet. But uh, the, the dog modifies its behavior or this is what you're doing for the dog. The dog, however, never has moral development. The dog's not going to get saved. The dog isn't made in God's image. There isn't going to be a crisis experience in the dog's life where the dog decides to live differently. But that is the case with people. God wants our attention. And what we're going to see today is that the the empty tomb of Jesus is the place where God through Jesus says, look at me. I want your attention. Nothing else will happen here unless you look at me. This morning's message is about the story of how we got to that empty tomb where the Father through Jesus says, look at me. There's four major passages that we're going to look at, and I'll throw in some other passages as well. If you want to, you can, you can chase this around the Bible, and I'll tell you where, where to go. The first one is the unlikely place of Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9, to be precise. And, and this is where God says... Look at me and see your sin. I'm just going to read this passage. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to, we're going to talk about why we're talking about it on Easter Sunday morning. This is Numbers 21, 4 to 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is a dark corner of the Old Testament. It would seem to be far away from the empty tomb that we are celebrating today. What's going on here? Well, Israel is coming to the end of its 40-year wilderness wandering. So they've, they've left Egypt. All the events of Genesis have happened. They've been, they've been in Egypt for 400 years. Moses has come. They've, they've, they've left Egypt. They've gone to Mount Sinai. They've received the, the law, which is how God wanted them or about how God wanted them to live. And now they're coming to the end of this wilderness adventure And people are dying because of their sin. There was the business some years before of the bronze calf. There was the refusal to enter the land. There was constant belly aching really about everything. Even Moses disobeyed God when he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. Aaron has now died. 
And in fact, everyone from that last generation must die before Israel enters the promised land, exception being Joshua and Caleb. And now a new generation has arisen, and this new generation must contemplate its rebellion against God before entering the land. And so there's this infestation of snakes. You say, well, that's kind of unlikely. Well, it doesn't seem as unlikely now. We have a worldwide virus. They got snakes. We got a virus. Okay, so this is what happens. And the people are forced to make a connection between sin and judgment. And they ask Moses to intercede. And so God tells Moses to make a representation of judgment, which is this bronze snake, and hang it on a pole. Now, let's be careful. God didn't say to worship the snake. He said to look at it and make the connection between judgment and your sin. Sin stands between us and life. That's the lesson they were to learn. We have the same lesson And we need a mediator. In that instance, it was Moses. And then this passage just kind of sits here. This is part of our five-day. Some of us are doing the five-day reading plan. It was, I think, two weeks we came across this passage. And you read it, and you're like, okay. And you just kind of let it sit there, and you you move on. You kind of forget about it a little bit until we get to John 3 verses 13 to 15, and suddenly this serpent comes up again. This is one of those extra passages, but you can go there if you want to. And in this passage, in John 3, we see sin on display in Jesus. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about what Nicodemus needs to do in order to to, to be born again. Jesus' words from John 3. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That's him. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So there is still rebellion between man and God. And there is still a need for a mediator. The wilderness with the snake reminds us that God through Jesus says, look at me. Look at me and recognize your sin. That's the first passage. The second one is John 12. Maybe you're already there. John 12, 27 to 33 And this is where Jesus says, look at me as I carry your sin. John 12, 27 to 33. Jesus has entered the city at this point. We read this passage last week from another gospel. He's entered the city, and the people have cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Israel and Jesus, if you remember, is celebrated here. He's celebrated in particular as the miracle worker who raised Lazarus, and the crowd wants to lift him up as their king. And so Jesus talks about being lifted up, the kind of lifted up that we really need and that he's going to do before he becomes their king. This is John 12. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Is that what I should say? No. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it, glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. 
And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. You see, Jesus is that mediator between us and God. And and, and when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, like we talked about on Friday night, our sin was displayed. But unlike the serpent in the wilderness, Jesus absorbs our sin. That's the way I like to think of it. He takes our sin on himself and so that when we look to him, and we acknowledge our sin and recognize that he's the mediator between us and God, and we trust in Jesus, that sin no longer exists, and it no longer stands between us and God. 2 Corinthians 5.17, For our sake he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Of God. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us, that means he bought us back from the curse of the law, that means receiving what we deserve, by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. At the cross, Jesus says, look at me as I carry your sin. Look at me. Third passage is John 20, 11 to 18. This is the passage that Steve read for us a few minutes ago. It takes place after the resurrection. And this is where Jesus says, look at me as I defeat Death. It's a great passage. And it's written from the perspective of the different participants in this business of not finding Jesus dead and then finding him alive. And in fact, you can work with this passage and move the text around to make it chronological, put it together with the text from the other gospel accounts. It's actually not too hard to do. And you, you, you see where Mary was standing next to the tomb, apparently by herself, when she meets Jesus. The women have found the tomb empty. The armed soldiers have run for their lives, and people are running back and forth. And there's Mary Magdalene. She's standing outside the tomb, and she sees Jesus, and she doesn't recognize him because there's something Something about resurrection life that requires help. We have to have our eyes open. And then Jesus reveals himself and he says, Don't cling to me as I am now. I am ascending. I'm about to be lifted up to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And then Mary runs and she says, I have seen the Lord. I've looked at him. And the tomb is empty. And and that empty tomb is the Father's stamp of approval on the work of Jesus at the cross. Before sin stood between us and God, now, for those who are depending on Jesus, nothing stands between us and God. Before there was death, now there is eternal life for those who are depending on Jesus. Colossians 2.13, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses. And so at the empty tomb, Jesus says, look at me as I defeat death. We could stop there, but we're not going to. There's one more place we want to go because this is how we relate to Jesus today. And we've been there in the book of Acts within the last couple of weeks This is Acts 2, 32 to 36. Acts 2, 32 to 36. This is where Jesus says, look at me as I serve you in my need, in your need, as you are right now. Acts 2, 32 to 36. This is what, this is actually Peter preaching about Jesus, explaining what has happened. And he says, This Jesus God raised up, 
And of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that's the Holy Spirit, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus has returned to the Father. He sent his spirit on all of those who trust in him. And Peter has explained what all of this means. It means that none of us have, respond, have responded rightly to Jesus. There is sin between us and God, but there is new life available in Jesus, which in fact is the new life of Christ himself. And Jesus helps those who depend on him by faith through his spirit. Colossians 3, 1 to 4, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. That's where he is right now. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus' work of redemption is complete. It is finished. Everything necessary for us to be right with God has taken place. But here's the deal. Jesus' work is only credited to those who trust him by faith. Has anybody here gotten or expected or expect to receive a stimulus check? Oh, yeah, I said we'd be sublime, not silly, or at least we'd move in that direction. But here we are. There's a lot of things you can do with a stimulus check, assuming you don't have auto deposit or something like that. You can take a stimulus check and you can make a paper airplane out of it. Toss it across the room. You could, you could wrinkle it up in a ball and you could throw it to Pippa, and Pippa will fetch it. Uh, you can use it as a bookmark, and you can leave it in an old book and then lose the book somewhere in your house. You could let the stimulus check slip underneath the, the seat of your car, and you could just forget about it until it's void more than a year from now. You can do all those things with a stimulus check. But the only way the check is of value or Forgive me, the only way it's credited to our account is if you take it to the bank and put it into the bank. Jesus' work of redemption is, is finished. There's nothing left that needs to take place. But his work gets credited to our account when we trust in him. Faith is the means by which we're saved. And until we depend on Jesus by faith, we're still like the snake bit Israelites who are out there in the wilderness who need to look at our sin and acknowledge our sin and recognize that we need a mediator. Until we depend on Jesus by faith, we're still like one of the people in Jerusalem who says, we need a king. We want you to be lifted up, but we don't want to deal with our sins. We want you on our own terms. It doesn't work that way. Until we depend on Jesus by by faith, we're still like Mary Magdalene, who looks at Jesus but doesn't recognize him. And Jesus says, look at me. Until we recognize and trust in Jesus by faith, we're still a 21st century, distracted, tech-crazy American who simply needs to look at Jesus and acknowledge our need for him and trust him, and then be lifted up along with Jesus. This morning, Jesus is saying, look at me. Some of us have trusted in Jesus in the past, uh, but I'm relatively certain that there are some here who haven't trusted in Christ. And he would have you look at this account of the empty tomb and acknowledge your sin that brought Jesus to us. Recognize Jesus. He is the mediator prepared 
by God and sent by God, recognized Jesus, he carried our sin, know Jesus as the one exalted to the Father who then pours out the Spirit of God to help his church and trust Jesus by faith, to be uh, lifted up, who, who is the one who gives us a new life and lifts us up with him. And then tell somebody. Tell me, I'd love to know. If you've trusted in Christ today, I won't blow your secret. I won't embarrass you, but I guarantee you, you're going to want to tell somebody else because indeed Jesus is lifted up and he says, look at me. And when we do and we trust him by faith, we're lifted up along with him and that's what we're celebrating this morning and that's why we're so happy, aren't we? Father, thank you. Thank you for the empty tomb. Every corner of the Bible moves toward that, toward the empty tomb where you were not dead, Jesus, and you were not dead there because you are alive and you're at the right hand of the Father. And today we look at you. You have our attention. And Lord, for anybody here who is not trusting in you, Oh, Father, by your grace, would you draw them to yourself that they would look at you and, and, and you would have their attention and maybe for the first time that person would depend on you today and then simply rejoice and then simply be happy because you are the one who has given us new life and you are the one who has lifted up your people to be with you. And so we praise you today and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So I get to do the, the dismissal, closing, however you want to call that, afterwards as well. So I'm going to break that in two parts, right? So dismissing in two parts. The first part is this. Well, I'm, also, I'm also giving Jamie time to get back from the bathroom with the five-year-old. <laughs> she was like, do you think I have time? And I was like, well, he's wrapping up. And she was like, all right, well, let's go. All right. And, oh, there, they'll be back. She's going to come up and don't embarrass her when she does. Um, first part of this dismissal is this, that, that maybe, maybe uh, you wonder what's real in all of this, where does this celebration come from, and, and let, let me tell you that if, if the celebration comes from a false place, then man, run from that. That's called hypocrisy, right? You know that word. But if, if you think maybe, maybe that celebration in certain people comes from a real place, if it, if it feels genuine to you and you want to know why, then, then get to know those people. Uh, I, get to, I get to do the dismissal, so I get to point at Brian and I get to point at Pastor Michael and I get to say, these are men, their families are families that, that there's, there's hypocrisy in all of us, uh, spoiler, but they're real people who love Jesus and the celebration is real. So... Uh, and then th- this room is just, it's just speckled with all sorts of real people um, who, who can say that Christ arose and that made such a difference in my life that th- the party is real and the life is hard, but the celebration is real. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Hey, you're back. So that's the first part of the dismissal. And then after this song, which you all know, I'm just going to say, go away. (laughs) That's the second half of the dismissal. Go have a lot of food. Eat yourself into a nap. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Waiting the coming day, that's Jesus, my Lord. Sing aloud. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose.
where we end the song and that's where we end the service thank you guys for for coming this sunday be with us next week i think we're open right he is risen, he is risen indeed. go away <laughs>